You are listening to the River of Suck podcast, episode one. I am your host, Andy Reiner. The River of Suck is all about cultivating a healthy attitude for music and for life. My first guest is Rushad Eggleston, the Bat Prince of Jick. Are you tuned to like an AA or like a... I'm tuned in. Oh. Yeah. All right. I think we can work with that. I'll just come down to you. It's fun to hang out down down there. I mean, I pretty much always do. Official, down a half step. Official Baroque tuning. 432? Is that what that 415. is? 415. 415. We introduced ourselves first as normal humans would. Welcome, Rashad, to the River of Suck. Tharnox, it is a pleasure to be challenged by your crepitude. <laughs> and then with our instruments. <laughs> I'm interviewing people at the show tonight who've never seen Rashad before, and I want to know what you guys think. I'm not sure what I think, man. It's hard to say. I can tell you I'm having a really good time. I would say that like he's doing a lot of things that are, for me, really, really musically interesting and complicated, but like everyone gets it. I'm not sure I can tell you tonight. I'm a little speechless. <laughs> I was here because I heard he was an amazing cello player. Okay, yeah. And I didn't know he was going to be like Tom Waits from hell. <laughs> <laughs> Who is Rashad Eggleston? A proprietor of Iguarfnies. Huh. I usually like to describe myself in a fairly dense and a self-pleasuring formats <laughs> rather than what the world wants to hear. For example... Let me just give you an example of uh, and why and why I think it works. My band Tornado Rider. Yeah. The first time we went to play any festival, our bio was the following: Tornado Rider is a powerful bird band of swirling goat god victory that lurks in the spooky regions and yells out over the mountains, clicking the gunt of Nairobi <laughs> and taking the slippers and the coffee and the potato farm earnestness into the now. That's a good bio. Yeah, and everybody that read it, even all these, like, because we were in Florida, and these southern people would come up to me and be like, man, I, have, I read your bio, and I had, to, I had to see what that was all about. You know, because most bios are like, right. oh, this guy sounds like if this person was mixed with that person, and he studied at this school, and he's played with these people. And I had those for a while, but, man, I just don't, they just, they hurt my soul. Mm-hmm. So I like to describe it abstractly. Dilla dog, dilla dog, dogie and tho, dogie and tho, dogie and tho, dilla dog, dilla dog, dogie and tho, dogie and tho, dogie and tho. Let's rewind to the early 2000s, when Rashad and I were both living in the Boston area. We met a humble and inspiring man named John McGann. John was a mandolin and guitar picker, my octave mandolin hero, one of my professors at Berklee College of Music, a brilliant musician, and one of the funniest people you could ever meet. He passed away tragically and suddenly in 2012, having made a lasting impact on everyone who met him. John McGann was like a Buddha. I got to play many, many concerts with him in his band Rust Farm. It was like my first uh, paying gig in Boston, I think, and my first time at Gray Fox. And I learned all their songs, and we used to jam out pretty hard, and it was fun. And then a few times I went over to John McGann's house, just me and him, and we recorded some stuff, fiddle tunes mostly. And he just had such like a outer space left field approach to all of them. It was like a fiddle tune was an opportunity for him to explore mythical, magical realms. And I 
have a very fond memory of us playing Flop Eared Mule and him almost moving me to tears with his solo because it sounded like it was like if Beethoven was taking a solo on Flop Eared Mule. <laughs> it was like so symphonic and yeah. just coming out blasting. He made he made the octave mandolin sound like 20 trumpets. Whoa. You know, it's just like he just got into the spirit and he came out blasting ecstatically, just like, I don't even know. I mean, the Slop Eared Mill is a kind of funny, yeah. funny <laughs> little tune. <laughs> yeah. So I don't even know how he did it or what he exactly played, but it was freaking brilliant and just totally lit me up. Yeah, and that's generally what he did all the time on pretty much every tune. You'd just be like, wow. I mean, nobody plays play stuff like that. Yeah. One thing John said has really stuck with me, and that's the river of suck. You're standing on the edge of the water. Behind you is your comfort cave. On the other side, you see your musical goals, or your life goals. We're looking over. It looks so awesome. There's, like, magical dancing fairies. Yes. All kinds of bizarre characters that are, like, the future versions of us running around doing the things that we wish we could do now. But the problem is, in between, there's a bunch of raging whitewater rapids. And there are rocks. There are piranhas swimming around, and you can see their really sharp teeth. My friend Sarah Gorak calls them thought piranhas. These little fish that are swimming around your brain, and that's like any negative thoughts that's gonna like, hold you back. That's the river of suck, because you have to suck at something before you're good at doing something. Yeah, for sure. It's I mean, yeah, in this case, it's like a, important to realize that the river of suck could be like a Mississippi river of wide-ass suck, you know, like a mile, <laughs> two miles long, crazy yeah. stuff. And I feel like, you know, when you're crossing it, you can only see barely in front of you, but that's, that's just it. You can see a couple f- feet in front of you, and you're just like, all right, if I can just make it over there. It's maybe like sometimes you're like crawling across rocks, just clinging for dear life, you know, like mm-hmm. you can just see a little bit in front of you, and you put your arm out, and you pull yourself over, and vice versa. But yeah, for me, it was a, uh, it was uh, years of, of that type of struggle, and still is. And that's the thing is like, it's almost like a never-ending river of suck. It's almost like you're always reaching the other side, while never reaching the other side. Right. You know, because if you do get to the other side, you realize that you've now crossed that river, but now you can see a whole new river that you didn't know was there before. Exactly. And now you're stuck on an island in the middle. Infinite rivers of suck <laughs> going on, which don't necessarily, I mean, then it doesn't have to be a bad thing. You end up being very grateful for the river of suck because, like, I love the discovery. I love the challenge of crossing the river and of getting to the other side and of, you know, the, if, conceiving of a thing that originally seems totally impossible for all practical purposes my brain is convinced it's impossible and I might as well give up and not do it but then there's some part of me that's just indomitable and it wants to keep trying and keeps practicing and then a year goes by and I look back at that moment when I thought it was impossible and I'm like look at this it's totally easy now it's like second nature and then once that becomes second nature then it it uh, opens up a whole other vista of impossibility mm-hmm. where you're like, no way, can I ever make it there? <laughs> and then sure enough, you just keep going a little bit at a time, foot by foot, and you get there. And it is a delicious joy and could provide me with entertainment for the rest of my life. Victor Wooten did a clinic at Berkeley while I was still there, and he told everyone, you need to be the USU that you can be. And I thought that was a really great way of saying it, which, with a lot less words than I had previously thought of, thought of the Absolutely. idea. Absolutely. The USU that you can be. Yeah. For sure. Words to live by. Because you can never be someone else. You're stuck. You wake up every day, and you're like, oh, here I am. Like that voice in your head when you wake up, and you're like, I'm here again. It's another day. Mm-hmm. Like I call that... I call that your you. Like, yeah. welcome to the day, you. Hi. Exactly. You come back into the concrete reality of your body and yourself and your life and your experiences and where you are and what you're supposed to do. And that yeah. whole thing is quite a momentum of you-ness. Yeah. I like to wake up every day and uh, 
write down or just think about like three or five things that you were like grateful for for the yesterday yesterday even if yesterday was seemed to be a day of suck there's still all these positive things that you can force yourself to extract from it and then moving on you feel like kind of like more powerful because you're like yeah even though yesterday uh, my old self used to think it sucked now i'm writing down officially that this is what was cool about yesterday Hmm. and then that and then that you also tell yourself right away that today is going to be an awesome day because those moments when you wake up and come back to yourself are very important i think to like start motivating yourself and uh cause yourself to have a better chance to have an awesome day. So how do we turn days into a progression of things that actually lead us to become more of ourselves than we were before? I think that the first way would be to find any spare time that you have or any time that can be used, even while you're doing something else, to get better at some of the things that you see in your future, you know, to move across the river of suck a small way mm-hmm. in the day. For example, for me, when I'm driving and practicing the viola upside down, I get to practice my bowing while I'm driving. That was a way that I have figured out to make every day be more me because my ideal me is like a bowing master and is like a just heavenly wizard of like being able to play any subdivision at any time with the balance any number of bounces at any tempo speeding them up throwing and rolls syncopations left hand Mm -hmm. muting a whole just like world of thing and i'm trying to get towards that and that is like I've gambled a lot of my emotional money on on reaching that place. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like I've been I've like told a bunch of people and invited a bunch of reporters and be like, watch me cross the river of suck. You know, made a whole <laughs> reality show. Now the whole world's watching me cross the river of suck. So yeah, I got to because you actually frequently post videos onto your Instagram, which is at Rashadicus. Yeah. To some extent, your Facebook and YouTube the, a little bit too. YouTube. Yeah. I feel like I've been watching through the internet, like your journey through the river of suck of Boeing. Yeah. It's huh? like, oh, look, there's the triplets are getting better. Like, whoa, how is he doing that bouncing thing? It's like these little windows. And I think to some people, it seems like, oh, man, this guy can do everything. But actually, we're just watching you try to become your vision of the guy who can do everything with your bow. And you're not there yet. No, 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 not there. I'm the thing is, I, I will always be at the beginning. That's what I've started to accept because after six years of trying to learn the bounce, and then I mean, that that's two t- since 2012, and it was like 1999 when I learned to chop, right? For those listeners who are not string players, this is the chop sound Rashad is talking about. <laughs> so there was all that, mm-hmm. and that got deeper. I think I am 100% convinced that I'm always going to be at the beginning of something because there's because because once you learn a new thing and it's always like a building block it's like you're learning some type of nugget yeah some type of essential nugget and then you're combining it with another thing to make another element and then you got to learn that element and then you're going to combine that with another element or all the old elements and then put them into 3 and then put them into 6a and put them into different time signatures and then figure out how you can do it in all the different contexts and uh and then to do it backwards and etc you know what i mean there's yeah. just never it's like literally impossible like in, string instruments and learning music is infinite in all directions <laughs> If you have a personal river of suck that you're in where you want to accomplish a goal, but you find it, it causes you pain. Like when I started chopping, it hurt. And I tried to figure out a looser way to do it. That's how people come up with their own techniques sometimes. And it also relates to, uh, well, because there's, there's something, there's also like, how do you explore new techniques without mental injury? Because, for example, when I was first ready to cross the River of Suck in college and I was looking across, my other side was an empty chair for me. And there was Mark O'Connor and Edgar Meyer and Stuart Duncan and those type of people sitting there and Chris Thiele playing their beautiful 
Apollonian, pristine, <laughs> wonderful, 816, like sacred geometry, architecture, high arcing, beautiful music. Yeah. That's where I was trying to head. <laughs> And in the process of crossing the River of Suck and floating downstream a little bit and floating downstream a little bit, instead of that, I ended up in a psychotic land of goblins and clowns and fairies and elves and mythical aliens and space stuff. And then I didn't care that I wasn't sitting there in that fourth chair in that mystical string quartet anymore because I changed. Yes. The River of Suck changed me for the better. And you became more yourself. Mm -hmm. And now you stand out because you're Rashad. Mm -hmm. Bat Prince of Jick. Yeah, exactly, exactly, man. Not some lame version of somebody else. Yeah, exactly. But everybody starts out trying to be something that they're not. I mean, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, you know, you idolize somebody that is that, that was themselves, but they're not you, and you want to head there, so you set out on a journey. Their only focus, their only purpose is to provide you with motion. You're going to move somewhere. You're going to try to get somewhere. Yeah. But always in the course of trying to get there, you're going to end up somewhere else. You're the first person I met who actually named a character for the negative thoughts that you have that show up in your brain. Yeah, for sure. Thought negative Ralph is one of my alter egos that sings negative songs. <laughs> it's a way of allowing the darkness to come out and flourish like it wants to rather than like being afraid of it or hiding from it. Mm -hmm. And it's a way of turning into song what would normally be really self-defeating thoughts, thereby making them into self um victorious thoughts right i mean because for example the song i'll never be good enough literally i was sitting there in my bedroom one night and i had a circular thought in my head i don't know where these things come from i think they're the thought piranhas yeah they don't you don't know where they come from it's like almost like when you're when you're playing a piece and you're and you worked really hard and it's really hard and you're you're gonna be like all right if i can get to the end then i can take a break from practicing and then you get really close to the end or you're filming something and then this voice comes in your head and it's like you're gonna mess it up bro and then you mess it up. And where does that voice come from? I didn't mean to have that voice in my head. I don't want it there, but it's there. Anyway, so it's the same thing which started to tell me, you'll never be good enough. You'll never be good enough. You'll never be good enough. Never be good enough. Never be good enough. Never be good enough. And it kept going and it turned into so ridiculous that it started to become a song. And I was like, all right, just let it be, good. Let it be a song, you know? And then let me show you how it goes. We just put a rhythm to it. They must be blind. You'll never be good enough. Never be good enough. Never be good enough. Never be good enough. You'll never be good enough. Never be good enough. Never be good enough. You'll never be good enough. Never be good enough. Never be good enough. You see, that's using negativity to have fun, which is obviously if negativity is going to be so damn persistent, it's just like, hey, hanging out with me, hang out with me, hang out with me. Hey, are you free? Are you free? You're, I know you're doing something. I know you're trying to be like really amazing right now and like a good person, but like we need to hang out like right now. It's like the neediest friend ever. So if it wants to hang out with you that bad, put it to work. Give it a broom or give it a guitar. I mean, what's the blues all about? You know what I mean? Right. Definitely. Yeah. Singing sad songs makes people happy. It's kind of weird. Listening, to, I mean, a lot of great songs are kind of sad songs, you know, but they, they, uh, they somehow um, transform the sadness to the point of transcending it and entering into just like a neutral zone of awesomeness and feeling. <laughs> it's good stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's not a 12 bar, but that's a blues that song yeah in, it has elements way. of blues yeah for sure it's the, it's the primary like mental blues that everybody no matter what their life background struggles with you know it's none of the form but all of the feeling yep exactly <laughs> exactly I mean we could be like 
You'll never be good enough, never be good enough, never be good enough, never be good You'll never be good enough, never be good enough, never be good enough. You'll never be good enough. <laughs> Too many voices in my head telling me I'm a loser. I guess they can't see all of my trophies. They must be blind. They must be blind. Well, you'll never be good enough, 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 never be good It's a 12 bar. Thanks. I've never done that. Huh? <laughs> nice. Sweet. That's a good exercise. Make any song into a 12 bar blues. Yeah. Fit it in there. Play it in all the keys. Oh, it's so cool to be in this uh, down a half step tuning. I definitely hit the brain thing where I was like expecting to be playing a different note. Yeah. And then you're playing this other note that was close, but it's like a half step away from the note you thought you would be playing. Mm hmm. Which is close, sort of. <laughs> It's like miles away from what you thought it was going to be. I know. It's pretty cool in music how much of a zoomed in world we live in in terms of space of the fingerboard where notes are so actually close together but seemingly so far apart. And then also in time when we're like we live in a world where like a second is a long time because you can play like 12 notes in a second. Right. Like I got to take one solo in that and during which my inner monologue, I don't think I could call it a healthy musical monologue because I got so stuck on like playing the right notes because I was disoriented that I forgot about the feeling. Oh, bit. man, yeah, I should have given you another chorus. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> I didn't know how long to make this song. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, but it's like that can happen to you on stage in front of people, can happen to you at home in your practice zone. This podcast is sort of about admitting those feelings and talking about them because we all experience it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That weird inner monologue that we just want, that's the negative Ralph or whoever it is for you, we all have that running through our heads and like, how do we get rid of it and just experience, I just want to feel the music, man. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, it's like you get rid of it by using it to your advantage in some way. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the classic way is that like, um, the fear and nervousness that you experience before going on stage, you know, anybody who's like a good at dealing with that will tell you that it's just one side of a two sided coin. And the other side of that coin is called excitement. You know, it's just excitement in disguise. It's your, it's your body like giving you enough, like it's, it's like a primal, like evolutionary strategy to get <laughs> nervous so that you perform your best thing and you do your best primal mating dance up there you know it's <laughs> yeah. giving you enough energy to kick ass right and the only thing that's difficult is when you're playing a kind of music that doesn't allow you to cut loose mm -hmm. you know and when you have to do something really technical and precise and still to this day if i had to go up there and do something technical and precise before running around and screaming my head off and acting like a clown and being a goblin then i would still probably get kind of nervous because it's like i can't use that energy to my advantage hmm. Um, so that's why I've developed the performance style that I have, for example, is so that I can use that fear and nervousness and adrenaline and whatever crazy chemical concoction that is to my advantage. 
Welcome back. We just took a little break and now we're feeling human again. Oh, yeah. Where we left it, though, I just want to come back to it for just a moment, was I had negative feelings about my solo running through my head during that 12-bar blues version of of the negative song. Since we're recording, because it's a podcast, I was able to go back and listen to it and I actually like what I played. So the funny thing is that when you're playing for other people, you have the weird inner monologue running through your head you don't understand the experience that someone's having watching you have those thoughts and play something different because i played something different than i meant to but it was something so i played something and then now i like it yeah it's kind of just a mad dash into the unknown and you got to hang on for dear life and then the the work if you're practicing for years is what prepares you to um still be awesome while you're crossing the river of suck into the unknown. It looks like Rashad dove into a haystack and his cello came out covered in hay and kazoos. I asked him how this came to be. Well, what's actually going on is up by the tuning pegs on my cello, on my cello, I have for years been attaching two kazoos um, of different materials. And uh, right now, one is plastic, and it's attached with rubber bands on the headstock. And the other one is wooden. Here's the plastic one. And here's the wooden one. And those are both attached with rubber bands. And then I was driving from Maine to Florida in one shot, and I stopped in Georgia to play some cello by an oak tree, and I found some Georgia moss hanging off the tree. (laughs) (laughs) Go put it on there. It feels good now. Yeah, it's it's, it's really fluffy. Yeah. So the kazoo is great for me because in my solo show, it's a way to take a solo to have this other stream of melodic input that isn't just me going, you know, to like... It's actually like almost a different instrument. Like, let's see. This will illustrate the difference. Let's go deeper. How does Rashad's artistic journey with the bounce relate to the river of suck? I could just give you a real quick list of the things that I used to think were impossible based on one discovery. Yeah. And uh, the first discovery was that triplet right there. The first thing I thought was impossible was to do it slow because I was Mm -hmm. like, it's gravity. It's based on the bow bouncing and you know, without me doing anything else, just letting it bounce again, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of like gravity. So I thought it couldn't go slow, just like you can't ride a bike past a certain speed. So yeah, it does top out. It does kind of bottom out at a certain tempo, but I'm definitely able to do it a lot slower now. And that's two down bows and one up bow. I could definitely not do this when I first started it. (laughs) Yeah. But it feels really good. It's like it, you feel it in your wrist going all the way up into your chest and then down your spine and lighten up all your chakras. Just super bounce, spiritual bounce, ohm bounce, boogie traska, nam muhadres bounce. Hmm. You know? Anyway, so that was the first thing I thought was impossible. But then I connected them. And then, uh, and then I quickly came up with... the same thing but the up bow is longer lasting and then if you can do that you should do it on up bow and then to connect them so you're going and that was pretty hard but I definitely thought it was I thought that it was impossible to go 
two notes per bow. And keep them going. I mean, I remember making a voice memo in 2014 in the winter where I was trying to play a piece that was like... Uh, and I was literally like... <laughs> and I was like, why is that so hard? Why can't I do it? Why can't I do it? And then it wasn't until like literally like 2016 that I started to be able to do that type of stuff um, and pretty steady. And then once you can do that, then that opens up the possibility of a, of a thing that in 2015 I conceived of, which was having some different rhythms in there. Like, cause you know, if you're just normal, normal bowing back and forth, you can use your left hand muting to get a bunch of cool rhythms like... But I was like, theoretically, you should be able to do that in the language of two at a time with the bounce. And that kind of stuff. So that was also, that totally felt impossible. And then it totally felt impossible to go three, three, two, like dig it, dig it, dig it, and to reset it. Because what it means is that you're able to do like eternal downs if you want. Kind of this weird wiggly thing. Anyways, so all those different things seemed totally, absolutely impossible. And I had to cross a large river of suck to get to them. And as, then as soon as I got to the other side, I would see the next river of suck. And just like where <laughs> I'm at now, um, I'm trying to even think of the things that are impossible right now. And I can't even demonstrate them because I can't do them. Right. But I can see them. And so, they're there. But but you have to have the vision of, like, I'm here, but I want to be somewhere. Like, I want to get to that other side. You need to have that vision, kind of have that, like, feeling of, oh, man, I can't do this. And then turn that, channel that into positive energy where you're able to practice it in a way where you suck at it for a long time. Because you're talking about 2012? Yeah. You're talking about a, a period of six years to develop a technique. Mm -hmm. Whereas most people try something, can't do it, and say, I suck, and that's it. That's the end of the story. So that is exactly, that's exactly what you're talking about, wading through the river of suck and being yeah. willing to be stuck in the suck yeah. for a long-ass time and feel like a freshman over and over and over again. Like, even like I do now, because of the things that I'm trying to do and, like, not being able to do them yet. Mm -hmm. How do we get from this is impossible to I'm going to dive in head first and I'm going to swim? That's using your own creativity to find a way to cross the river. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's, it's improvising in slow motion, improvising away from where you are to this unknown place that theoretically exists. And that is the joy of practicing for me, which is way more fun than like classical music practice, kind of, which is like you have to do these prescribed exercises and you're always on this track. This is blazing your own trail. It's in the wilderness. It's seeing a mountain over there and being like, how the hell do I get there? And then making it up. Should I take a right? Should I take a left? Or like, what can I possibly do to move forward at all? Mm -hmm. You know? And then you have to break it down. Is like, are you going to do it like... You know, I mean, like, like when I was finding this, when I was trying to do the two in a row, I start by making up a phrase like, yeah. And then if you create some type of music, then that gets it into your heart more. And like, you can love it. You mm -hmm. can, you can like love what you're trying to play. You're then, you, then you're actually playing music rather than just some exercise. Right. It's not a tech. It's, it's a technique that helps you get your, your actual inner voice out of your instrument. Like, but the technique yeah. by itself is kind of meaningless. Exactly, exactly. And then in the course of practicing a thing like this, whatever it is, when I'm crossing the river of suck, what I'm doing is composing dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of little tunes, little compositions that are, uh, you know, using some element of the thing that I'm trying to do. You know what I mean? Little mini versions and stuff. I asked Rashad if he would show us in a song how the cello and kazoo came together with his new techniques. It's in my song Lummy 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 Larlock's Pentagru, which goes kind of like Lummy 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 Larlock's Pentagru, Lummy 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 Gathering Pepper Bay, Lummy 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 Vice Court Vicky Lady Lummy 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 Lummy
concubine, gibby, 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 four zero, thank gibby, 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 build, move, buck strong, gibby, 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 and it, to cut to the end of the song where this happens, it goes, Sturgonurk's vow is an unto, junto, plebox, the boss goes, burgon on blade, bliminic news, jack of unto, junto, screw in the tarragon lamp in the shade. Screw it in, 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 screw it in. And so then I would naturally play that melody, the vocal melody, on the kazoo in a kind of funky way. But in the old days, I would do it just over this basic boom chick, like this. But then the cello evolved to be able to play those same kind of syncopations. It goes like this. Sweet. Well, yeah, then now it sounds like music. Yeah, exactly. No, there, there's so many fun levels. It's like, because once you can do the thing on your bow, then the very next thing that I try to do is be able to rap over it or sing over it. For, or I'll take one of my old raps. I've got tons of raps mm-hmm. from the old days. Like when I learned to do the muted rhythms, like... <laughs> Brenda from Savannah, so he drives underground. Bumbles in the skeleton, the grumbling will be sound. Trying to bubble in 80s, eating a plate in a great, great fumbling up. A rumble on the wicker falls of fate. Do you walk within the wagon with the purple open room? Falling down amongst the atmosphere of urban plants of When you waited for the lizard to get the sore motor across, so you're riding, rolling, and falling on an albatross with the marker. It's an important, etc. You know? So you instantly start putting it into music and contextualizing it according to your stees. And then um, <laughs> and then there's so many things you can you do over it. But yeah, singing over it is like the first thing. Yeah, because, like, if it doesn't feel good to sing over, then why do it? Right, exactly. Plus, in the act of singing over it and uh, having to use part of your mind to sing, it forces you to develop, to, to move that rhythm or that technique deeper into your subconscious so it's more on autopilot. And mm-hmm. when it's on autopilot, that's when it can be called upon at any time in any situation and you don't have to think about it because you want to get sub-rational with it. You want to get beyond thought mm-hmm. deep enough because I feel like down deep down <laughs> in the river of the suck, it's too cold for those tropical ass thought piranhas. They can't get down there when oh. you're deep in the subconscious zone. You know what I mean? So now you're talking about like a fjord because yeah, normal rivers have like bottoms that if you like tried, you could find the bottom of, but a fjord is when the mountain just continues deep into the water yeah. and they have them in Scandinavia. So so like the water is just super deep. You can't really find the bottom if you're like without your like scuba gear and your like thing to make sure you could don't die if you go down there. Yeah, or because it's mythical, you could just learn to freaking breathe underwater. Oh. And it sounds like a Norwegian like you could do in black metal uh-huh. based over like Partly, you've been writing new new music, right? Mm-hmm. With you've been listening to death metal, very much. Yeah, but, death metal and black metal mainly. What are some of your favorite death metal, black metal bands right now? Uh, man, the you know the album that I listen to almost every day for the last long, long, long time. Whenever I need my death metal fix and just like get into it is a uh, it's called when satan lives by deicide and oh, it's yeah. a live it's a live show from chicago halloween 1997 <laughs> i think and but what's it's incredible because it's all live and they there's no studio trickery and to hear how fast those dudes are playing i mean a lot of the songs are like you know 16th notes at like 190 mm-hmm. and but but then there's all they play like there's parts in five and there's parts in seven and they're just like a total like american like straightforward death metal band but it's so exciting they have all these metric modulations and tons of stuff in three and they really explore like the triplet thing which i really like about death metal like the but they double it up so it's like instead of just going like a they go and then he comes in with the beastly like 
but dude, so loud and just so they're all just so tight and the guitar is coming screaming and it's just crazy. I, I love that album. I listen to it almost every day. And then I have an almost daily habit of listening to uh, Battles in the North by the Norwegian band Immortal. Yeah. And that one helps me go to sleep in the afternoon. Really? Mm-hmm. Huh. I put it on and it like, it kind of defies like anal- analytical reasoning. <laughs> As we're sitting here, I'm, I'm making a connection in a way though between the vocals of death metal and black metal. They're kind of unintelligible, right? Yeah. Like you hear the vocalist and so much about what they're doing. If you were to hear them live and you didn't know the song and you hadn't like read the lyric booklet at home, you have absolutely no idea what they're saying. Right. And it's basically its own form of nonsense vocals in metal, which is for me, like you finally coming over to this like dark side of metal is like combining that with the nonsense train that you've been on for years. Yes. Right? Yes, exactly. It's like, it doesn't matter if you know what I'm saying and if it means something. Yeah, right. Right. Exactly. No, that's one of the greatest things about death metal for me is that you don't have to you don't have to engage that analytical like verbal part of your brain. It just kind of the vocals are there and they wash over you and they they're part of the whole sonic experience. Hmm. Cool. Which is how I want my vocals to be usually when I'm speaking in nonsense. You know what I mean? I mean, people can hear if there's a th or a g or a k or whatever. But it's like when I say machu machu ildi pildi kuma kuma natube angostrama matu gunto ilgo mortis pligarak fimpi fimpi unto bunto narvo pleski vibnaroth plein de sock nguix a fumbi fanter lork. I mean, I'm hoping that people are just in, enjoying the different vowels and s- consonants in there, you know? So and the rhythms. So does nonsense have meaning? I feel like it has meaning in the way that music has meaning in in the emotional registry of it you know Mm -hmm. so Um, so like the lack of meaning doesn't inherently mean that it's meaningless no it's not meaningless it just doesn't make sense in the linear way i see it making vertical sense what i call vertical sense whereas normal sentences and words and paragraphs like what i'm saying now these make horizontal sense where you're getting from point a to point b explaining (laughs) something versus just going straight down into the deep mind of emotional experience the same way as like it's because it's like what does this mean what does that mean right it's an abstract musical idea yeah but you would mean but yeah but you wouldn't say it's meaningless right right so that's the same thing as like uh that's the same thing as like um you know, same thing. Right. I mean, I mean, different things, but, you know, <laughs> same concept of vertical meaning. It's almost like it can mean different things to different people, which is like the definition of art in the first place. Right on. Yeah. <laughs> One amazing thing about a podcast where I ask musicians about inspiration and self-doubt is actually getting to play some music together. I put the sheet music to a new tune of mine, Bro and Oak, on a music stand. Here is Rashad's first time playing it.
I want to thank you for being here, Rashad. You're very welcome. For the listener who wants more of your music, where can they find it? Well, you can scoot over to my band camp. That's R-U-S-H-A-D dot bandcamp dot com. www.rushad.bandcamp.com And uh, I have like, I don't know, 10 albums up there, different stuff. Uh, an album of voice memos, some multi-track stuff, my, both my Wild Music of Snee albums, which total like 80 tracks total. And... Uh, All kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff up there, and a lot of it is for free download if you want, but if you want to, you know, you got some bucks and you want to kick me down some flows, certainly would help, always love it. No one ever said crossing the River of Suck would be easy or comfortable. So I want to thank you for tuning in and giving it a chance. Visit riverofsuck.com for all the latest updates on future episodes and guests. Become a member of the River of Suck swim team to support this podcast and access exclusive content, extended interviews, and high-quality downloads of music recorded for this podcast, including the piece you just heard and the piece you're hearing now. My name is Andy Reiner. Till next time, keep swimming! Thought